Um, another type of um, uh, molecular cue that we use is atmospheric perspective. So this is where um, objects that are up close, like a building, for example, if you're if you're standing looking <coughs> at a building um, up close, you can see detail and colors in that building, right? So if you're like in New York City and you're looking up at the at the world at the One World Trade Center, the new building they have there, and you're looking up at it, uh, it's a beautiful building. It's very impressive, and you can see all the detail of the building. But if you're across the river in New Jersey, looking at it from a distance, it's go, you're, it's going to look fuzzy, and the color's not going to be as good. It's going to be slightly blue tinted because of the atmosphere that you're looking that the, because you're looking at it through more atmosphere. So we use that fuzziness uh, to judge how far away things are. Texture gradient. Um, if you have a bunch of, um, like, say, a, a giant group of people, uh, like at a concert or some sort of outdoor event, uh, the people that are closest to you are going to be um, more separated from each other than the people way in the distance. They're going to look more crunched together as you uh, go further away. And we use that gr texture gradient also uh, to judge distance. And then finally, shadows. Um, shadows, we actually use shadows a lot in judging distance and where things are located. Um, what th that's one of the things that, that was learned early on in computer animation was that you really had to shadow things correctly so that people would perceive them as being real. Um, so here's an example of uh, the, uh, atmos the, the, uh, the atmospheric um, perspective. So if you notice this, uh, these rocks here, uh, we see a lot of detail in the way the uh, algae is growing on those rocks and um, we can see a lot of detail here in the in the plants. We see some detail here, but not as much. Uh, you know, I can't. I really can't tell about the algae that's growing here, the way it's growing here. And then, of course, the rocks that are further away uh, are fuzzy, and we judge that these rocks are further away than these rocks because of that fuzziness. And here's the texture gradient. Um, here's people, like a big group of people at a marathon. And notice that the people that are in the front are spaced further apart than the people that are in the back. Uh, they're packed in more tightly. <coughs> now, they're not actually packed in more tightly. They just appear that way. And we use that um, uh, increase in uh, uh, texture uh, to judge how far away thing, how deep things go, how far away, and similarly with the flowers as well. If you're looking at a field at, at these field of tulips, you see that the tulips up front, uh, there's a lot of space between them, and then the tulips in the back, you can you can't make out any space. And again, we use that cue to judge how far away the the field of tulips goes. If you look at the uh, <coughs> if you look at this uh, image here. Uh, one of the, and if I were to ask you, um, if I were to ask you how high above this chessboard are these spheres located, uh, each one, and you're like, well, I, I really, I don't know. Um, you know, they could be equal distance. They could be equally high. Or maybe this one could be higher than than the rest. I don't know. I can't tell. But if you put the exact same picture but then attach uh, shadows to the picture, you get a much better idea. As a matter of fact, it tells you that these guys are pretty are pretty much sitting on the board, and then it goes up, and then this one's kind of floating above the board, as you can see here. Notice how it would change if we move the little spots, uh, these little shadow spots underneath the balls. Then it would look like they're all sitting um, on the chessboard. <clears throat> Here's a great example of uh, um, the texture gradient um, and shadows, right? How we use shadows. Um, if you look at these shadows here on uh, on this image and then compare it to the to this image here, um, we're actually able to 
look and use the shadows in this image to tell where the ridges are and where the little the little valleys, the little pits are. Notice you can't really tell that here because the sun is, I guess, directly on top uh, and, and there's really no shadow. So it's kind of hard to tell where the ridges are and where the, uh, where the valleys are. But when the sun is uh, coming in at an angle here as it is in this picture, it makes it real obvious where the ridges are and where the, and where the dips occur. So we, we do automatically use shadows to, to determine position and, and, uh, and distance. So what we just <coughs> so what we just talked about was um, <laughs> was uh, monocular cues, right? Monocular cues in judging um, uh, distance. Uh, but we also have cues that are based on motion, uh, motion-based cues. And of course, we need those because. Uh, <laughs> we move through the world and, and we see things moving through the world so we have to be able to judge where we're going and where things are going. Um, one of the fundamental cues that we use that are based on motion is called motion parallax. Motion parallax is where close objects uh, that are moving in the same direction of movement that you're moving um, move pretty move pretty quickly and then the further away they get the, the, the they appear to move more slowly um, so if you're dry imagine if you're driving and um, you know you're going 60 miles an hour on the expressway and somebody buzzes by you going 85 as they pass you uh, there it's going to be moving at a, at a good clip but the further the way they get to you, uh, the, the further away they get from you, it's going to look like the car is moving, is not moving as fast. And that's because of this motion parallax. Uh, deletion and accretion. Um, this is where objects are covered or uncovered as we move relative to them. So if you're, um, you know, if you're walking uh, by um, where this can and this cup are located on a table, you know, and as you walk by, you're going to see, you know, that cup sort of moving along. It's not moving, right? But as you walk by it, it's going to kind of appear to be moving. And, and, uh, a, and as this cup covers this can, uh, that's deletion. And then as it uh, uncovers it again, that's accretion. So we're able to tell... Uh, as we're moving, we're able to tell as we're moving that we're probably closer to this cup. You're closer to this cup if you're walking along and you walk past it than you are closer to this thing. And you're able to tell that because of the deletion and accretion that happens between the cup and the, uh, and the, and the can. So this is an example of how we can use motion-based cues with one eye, with just one eye. We're going to see later on that we can use with two eyes as well when we you know, compute the relative uh, pictures that are on two eyes, but we also use motion-based cues with one eye. Uh, notice as we're moving past this tree that's closest to us, the um, point on this tree we call this point, you know, this little green point right here. As we're moving past the tree, right, this is, this is one eyeball that moves from here to here. This, this image does not represent two eyeballs. It's one eyeball that's going here, then it moves to here. This eyeball starts here, and then it moves to here. So before you move, that point is painted here on the retina. And then you move, and that point moves to this point here on the retina. So it goes from T1 to T2. Notice how far it moves. Uh, relative to this example, where we're looking at something that's further away, in this case a house. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. <coughs> and the house, um, the point on this house appears here initially, and then we move. And then it appears here. What do you notice that's different here between this eyeball and this eyeball? 
Well, on this eyeball, the point moved further across the retina. It swooshed across the retina further than this point did. This point only swooshed a little bit across the retina. That distance, that amount of movement that points make across the retina is a monocular cue that we use to judge movement, uh, um, uh, to, to judge distance while we're moving. Things that are closest to us are going to move much further across the retina than things that are further that, that are further away. This is a very handy little chart um, because what it does is it uh, gives you an idea of where different uh, depth cues are most effective. So um, so up close, so zero to two meters away. Um, we use deletion and accretion, occlusion, relative size, accommodation, convergence, uh, motion parallax, and relative height. Uh, notice that from 2 to 20 meters away, uh, <clears throat> which is roughly, I guess, 6 to 60 feet away, roughly, uh, notice that accommodation and convergence don't work very well. Uh, in other words, measuring how much our eyes are crossing, uh, because that only really is telling us the, the the amount our eyes are converging only tells us if something's really close or really far <laughs> in, in which case it's here um, <coughs> it's either here or it's not um, motion parallax we use that like when you're driving uh, relative height we use that and then above 30 meters anything that's more than about 70 feet away uh, we use relative height, occlusion, relative size, and of course atmospheric perspective. Okay, so binocular depth perception. Up to this point we've been, um, <coughs> excuse me, up to this point we've been talking about cues that um, you only need one eye for. Now we're going to talk about the use of both eyes for detecting distance. And this is, um, when you talk about two eyes, you're talking about stereoscopic vision um, and we use stereoscopic cues for depth perception you've probably at least once um, in um, in the last couple of years seen a movie in 3d and you know that in order to see that movie you have to wear those special glasses and those glasses receive signals uh, from the screen to uh, alter your perception of the movie and give you slightly different um, images on each eye so that you have this perception of three dimensions. <coughs> There's a very famous medical case of this woman named Sue. She had strabismus and I'm sure you've probably seen uh, people with strabismus. This is a person that has one eye that goes this way, one eye that goes that way, you know, wall-eyed, you know, that's kind of looking the other way. Well, she had it really bad. And, uh, you know, she had surgeries when she was a kid to try to correct it, but it didn't help. And she was able to get by, though. She was able to get by and live a fairly normal life. Um, but she used monocular cues for depth perception. And she, learned, she realized this one day when she was reading about, uh, you know, vis visual perception. She realized that she was only using monocular cues. So she actually went to an opto uh, ophthalmologist who gave her exercises to exercise her eyes so that they were coordinated. And within a few months of doing that, she was able to see in stereo. She talked about the very first time that that happened where she was leaving the doctor's office. She sat in her car and got ready to start it and she noticed that the steering wheel was in the steering wheel and the dashboard were in three dimensions. She had never experienced that before, so she said the steering wheel was like floating in space in front of her. And you know, since then she's been able to see in uh, normal uh, uh, 3D like like the rest of us do. But it was a very it was a shocking experience for her. And she had a lot more experiences like that as she got used to seeing in 3D.